The places Canadians call home are the traditional territories of many First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples. I'd like to take this opportunity as well to thank our sponsors and supporting organizations for their generous support. The Women's Entrepreneurship Strategy Ecosystem Fund, the Federal Economic Development Agency for Southern Ontario, Air Canada, Global Affairs Canada, the Canadian Trade Office in Taipei, our partners and supporting organizations, including CEO, Venture Labs, and the Taiwan Institute of Economic Research. Now, before we begin, a few housekeeping matters. The webinar is being recorded for internal use. Please use the Q&A box to post any questions you would like to ask our panelists, and we'll do our best to answer as many of the questions time permitting, of course. Should you wish to hear the webinar in French, please follow the instructions posted in the live event Q&A box. All housekeeping matters are posted in the same Q&A box, and for technical support during the session, please contact events at asiapacific.ca. The session is scheduled to conclude at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Before I introduce today's speakers, I'd like to take a minute to advise our viewers about our upcoming technology-enabled virtual mission to Taiwan. The two-day conference, which is open to the public, will take place from 1 to 2 March 2021 and will begin at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The program features inspirational women thought leaders, including Taiwan's Digital Minister, Honor Audrey Tang, and successful business, women in business from both Taiwan and Canada. A pitch session is an important part of our agenda as well, enabling delegates to introduce their companies and showcase their innovative products and services to a broad audience, which will include Taiwanese business representatives interested in our delegates' businesses. Personalized B2B or business-to-business -business matching sessions are being carefully arranged for delegates and will be scheduled for the month of March following the mission. The public is cordially invited to attend, so please pencil in the dates March 1 to 2 into your calendars. We'll notify you through social media when registration opens for the mission. Today, we have a great lineup of speakers and they include Ms. Sarah Wilshaw, Assistant Deputy Minister and Chief Trade Commissioner at Global Affairs Canada, Representative Winston Chin, Chen of Taipei Economic and Cultural Office, Jennifer Cook, Corporate Lead, Women in International Trade at Export Development Canada, Michelle Scarborough, Managing Partner, Strategic Investments and Women in Technology Venture Fund at Business Development Bank of Canada or BDC, Corey McDougall, Director, International Business Growth Branch, Ministry of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade for Ontario, and Benjamin Kolesnik, Senior Manager, Trade Policy and Negotiations Branch, Ministry of Jobs, Economic Recovery and Innovation in British Columbia. We hope to allow a short Q&A after each speaker, speaker, time permitting, of course, so please post your questions in the Q&A box. So we're going to begin with um, Sarah Wilshaw, uh, Assistant Deputy Minister and Chief Trade Commissioner at Global Affairs Canada. Sarah, over to you. Hi, Christine. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Bonjour. Uh, my, as uh, Christine just said, my name is Sarah Wilshaw. I'm Canada's Chief Trade Commissioner, part of Global Affairs Canada, and I'm coming to you today from the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. So. On um, behalf of the Government of Canada, I really want to thank Christine and all of the Asia Pacific Foundation for providing me this opportunity to speak on the occasion of the first Canadian women only virtual business mission to Taiwan. It's pretty exciting. Uh, C'est un honneur d'être présente ici aujourd'hui de participer à cet important webinar sur euh, le marché taiwanais et le soutien gouvernemental aux petites et moyennes entreprises. Permettez-moi tout d'abord de saluer toutes les femmes entrepreneurs canadiennes qui participent à cet webinaire euh, dédié à Taiwan, un marché qui mérite d'être euh, mis en exergue euh, 
uh, vu son potentiel. With a population of 23.7 million, Taiwan is a thriving democracy with a vibrant market economy. Its per capita GDP is the ninth highest in Asia and Oceania. Taiwan's GDP is estimated to have grown as well by 2.98% in 2020, one of the few economies to have shown some robust growth in that year, obviously. Um, it's been a challenging time for many, and I'm sure you'll hear more about this uh, from others, uh, speakers uh, today, but uh, you know, the strong economic performance was really uh, boosted by its success in controlling the COVID-19 pandemic. Beyond those new challenges sort of posed to us by this, uh, by the current situation, it remains in Canada's and Taiwan's interest to create and maintain strong relationships, which we've been doing for many years, to advance peace and economic prosperity. Canada and Taiwan are close partners with robust business to business ties, shared values and significant collaboration in science, technology and innovation. And notably, the annual Canada-Taiwan Economic Consultation allows our senior officials from both sides to discuss multilateral initiatives and to further develop long-standing and new areas of bilateral cooperation, including market access for Canadian agricultural products. However, there's definitely room to do more and an important opportunity to strengthen our collaboration is actually happening this year with the Year of Canada-Taiwan Innovators, which will advance innovative partnerships between Canada and Taiwan by helping companies to adopt new technologies to create business and restructure global supply chains. Permettez-moi maintenant de parler du rôle important du service des délégués commerciaux, notre réseau d'experts en commerce international. Now more than ever, Canada's Trade Commissioner Service helps Canadian businesses grow abroad by connecting them with its funding and support programs, international opportunities, and its network of trade commissioners in more than 160 cities worldwide. We have more than a thousand trade commissioners in Canada and around the world, and they are ready to help guide Canadian companies on their international business journey by assessing potential for specific markets, helping to develop market entry strategies, and helping resolve complex business problems. They also help companies navigate and leverage free trade agreements to gain preferred access to markets all over the world. The TCS also offers Canadian companies and organizations funding to access international markets and opportunities. Our CanExport program provides funding in four categories, SMEs, associations, innovation and community investment. Each category has a unique set of eligibility criteria, requirements and funding available. In addition, the Canadian International Innovation Program or SIP supports Canadian companies with funding and support to pursue joint international research and development projects with foreign partners that have the potential for commercialization. So there's lots of support out there. Canadian companies can use the TCS to gain strategic market intelligence through tailored advice and complementary export support programs to help them enter international markets. For instance, through the Canadian Technology Accelerator Program, Canadian companies with an existing validated product in the sectors of clean tech, life sciences, and ICT and digital industries can have a soft landing in key global tech hubs around the world, including in Taiwan. In market, companies are able to access mentors, investors, and partners with accelerators and incubators to help enhance their growth. All TCS clients can also access sector and country specific information, guides, complimentary advice on international business opportunities simply by contacting their local trade commissioner at one of our six regional offices across Canada. So we welcome you to do that. We are continuously improving to create a better integrated and more modern TCS. This includes undertaking a significant digital transformation to modernize our client experience, our digital tools and our online presence to enhance our client relationships and data management and to optimize our service delivery. And by providing dedicated support, the TCS is committed to helping exporters who identify with groups underrepresented in international trade. And this includes firms owned by women, also indigenous people, youth, visible minorities, and members of the LGBTQ2 community with resources. These are dedicated resources that are um, available on unique supplier diversity opportunities and targeted initiatives, including group specific trade events and missions like this one. 
Um, according to Statistics Canada, SMEs make up 97.9% of all businesses in Canada. That's about 1.2 million businesses. And women-owned SMEs account for 15.6 of Canada's total SMEs. Of the total of women-owned SMEs, 11% are exporters, which is almost on par with the percentage of male-owned exporting SMEs. So there's still a little gap. The, the men export around 12.1%. So there's still a little bit of room for the women there to, uh, to catch up and, uh, and then to, you know, leap ahead uh, as they export a slightly lower share. We can definitely do better. The full and equal participation of women in the economy, uh, I believe, is essential to Canada's future competitiveness and prosperity. And the Government of Canada's women's entrepreneurship strategy is a nearly $5 billion investment. Christine spoke about this earlier. It aims to increase women-owned businesses' access to financing, talent, networks, and expertise, all the things they need to start up, scale up, and to access new markets. The TCS is committed to working with our partners across the Minister of International Trade's portfolio to advance gender equality and ensure that all exporters have the opportunity to succeed in international markets. The investment in the winter, women's inter entrepreneurship strategy includes an additional 10 million over five years to Global Affairs Canada's Business Women in International Trade initiative to connect Canadian business women with expanded global export and trade opportunities. Depuis le lancement de l'initiative des femmes d'affaires en commerce international, le service des délégués commerciaux a dirigé des délégations d'entreprises axées sur les femmes dans le monde entier. La première mission commerciale de ce type a été effectuée à Washington en 1996. So that's a, a while back and we've got a lot of experience. And there's a lot more going on and we're excited to have you involved. In this, uh, in the last fiscal year, the Trade Commissioner Service led and supported 25 initiatives in 22 international markets in support of 253 women-owned or women-led exporting businesses, including delegations to women-focused supply diversity conferences in the U.S. and a delegation to France and Belgium to leverage the CETA. That's one of our trade agreements. The TCS also engaged in women-focused in initiatives, including on-the-ground support for the Asia-Pacific Foundation of Canada's women-only business delegation that went to Japan in April 2019, and the APFC's virtual women-only business delegation that went to South Korea in November. In 2019, in June, Minister Ng also announced a federal investment a federal investment of more than 1.7 million to support APFC to undertake more trade missions and other special initiatives as part of the Women's Entrepreneurship uh, Strategies Ecosystem Fund. We're really excited to see the results of these coming in. As we continue to take steps towards economic recovery, let me assure you that Canada does remain very focused on steering efforts to restore mutually beneficial supply chains, to strengthen and diversify our trade relationships, and to support rules-based Based trade. There are incredibly exciting opportunities for women entrepreneurs in Taiwan, and I hope this webinar will be an opportunity not only to strengthen the ties between us, but to explore those new avenues for collaboration too. So following the webinar, I do invite you to reach out to our trade commissioners at one of our six regional offices across Canada, and all you need to do is visit our website at tradecommissioner.gc.ca to learn more. Je vous souhaite un excellent webinar. Thank you. Merci. Et chez chez. Very much, uh, Sarah, for those uh, very insightful presentation and uh, information. And I do hope uh, we've been working very closely with the Trade Commissioner Service and, and really appreciate the support we're getting from them. So thank you again. We'll switch over to um, Jennifer Cook. Thank you and hello everyone. Bonjour à tous et à toutes. I'm very excited to be part of today's session with the Asia Pacific Foundation on this Women's Only Trade Mission. Je vais présenter en anglais aujourd'hui, mais je suis contente de répondre aux questions en français aussi si vous en avez plus tard. As Christine mentioned, I'm uh, Jennifer Cook and I lead the Women in Trade Strategy at Export Development Canada. And I'm speaking with you today from the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, who we thank for sharing this land. Next slide, please. 
I'm going to try and cover a lot of ground today. I'm going to start by maybe level settle, level setting a little bit to tell you who EDC is and how we help Canadian businesses, as well as our commitments to Canadian women-owned and women-led businesses. And I'll outside, outline some of the financial tools and knowledge solutions that EDC can provide to help you along your, ex, uh, your export journey. Um, I'll go through the early parts of this presentation quite quickly so that we can hopefully spend a bit more time on the financial tools. Next slide, please. So for those of you who might not be familiar with EDC, our job is essentially to help Canadian companies do business successfully in international markets. Next slide. We're Canada's export credit agency, meaning and we're a crown corporation, 100% owned by the federal government. As such, we're Canada's international risk experts. So we use our deep knowledge of international trade and global buyers to enable us to take on and manage significant levels of risk in order to help you, Canadian companies, grow your businesses. Next slide, please. EDC is part of the federal family of organizations that all work together to support Canadian companies as they venture abroad to grow and access new markets. So um, we work very closely together as Team Canada with the Trade Commissioner Service, uh, who you just heard from with Sarah Wolfshaw, as well as BDC and the Canadian Commercial Service. I think you'll be hearing from Michelle a little bit later from BDC. Next slide, please. There's many misconceptions about exporting, uh, and this is, I spend a lot of time, particularly with women entrepreneurs, misconceptions about exporting and about EDC. And one of the main ones is that it's only for large companies or those that are making and actually shipping products overseas. But in fact, we help companies of all sizes and in all sectors, including those whose business is in delivering services. Of course, COVID-19 has caused massive disruption for Canadian companies and for our economy. And EDC is here to support those Canadian companies, both in good times and in bad times. And we're playing a role in responding to this current economic crisis. Um, in response to COVID-19, the Government of Canada temporarily expanded EDC's mandate, allowing us some domestic powers, meaning we can support all Canadian businesses during this challenging time, whether they export and sell internationally or only within Canada. And this is in place until the end of 2021. Next slide, please. Now more than ever, EDC is committed to engaging and supporting under represented entrepreneurs in trade, including women-owned and women-led businesses. And we're really doing this with intention. We know that the number of women entrepreneurs is growing and we can have an enormous benefit to our economy and to our community. And our goal is to support them to grow and scale globally. Next slide, please. We're investing resources, including onboarding my role as dedicated corporate lead to be really accountable for increasing our support to more women entrepreneurs. As champions within Canada's women entrepreneurship strategy, we're reaching out to women entrepreneurs more proactively and have a strategic plan to focus, invest and measure our progress in supporting women owned and led businesses. And we're working closely with the entire ecosystem supporting women entrepreneurs to ensure that you have the support you need. Next slide, please. So you may or may not have heard some of these facts and figures. Our economy at the end of the day oh, is stronger you. when there are more women Sorry. entrepreneurs. Oops. We know that there's great yeah. potential for more women entrepreneurs to export. As Sarah mentioned, 11% of Canadian women owned businesses are exporting today, and that's over 12,000 companies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, they are four times more likely to be larger than non-exporters, and they're also 25% more innovative and competitive when playing on a global playing field. Typically, exporters' businesses are less risky because they're more diversified, have a broader set of customers, and are better equipped to handle the ebbs and flows of economic upturns and downturns. And at the end of the day, this leads to more resilient companies who stay in business longer. So we know that if we increase the number of women-owned businesses who export in Canada, even just by a small amount, we can add significantly to the value of Canada's economy, and that would be good for everyone. Next slide, please. So at EDC, our approach is grounded in five main pillars. It starts by inspiring and building awareness among women entrepreneurs about taking their business global and about how EDC can help. We also want to educate, providing the knowledge and skills so that women can export with confidence. 
providing connections both to the ecosystem of organizations that can help as well as to the opportunities internationally and to enable with financial tools and empower women with our corporate support for gender equity and women's economic empowerment broadly. At the end of the day, success will be when there are more Canadian women-owned and women-led businesses providing their goods and services to the world. And and per the next slide, please, we've set targets and we've launched initiatives aimed specifically at creating more opportunities for women in trade to access markets and to access capital that you need to grow beyond borders. And we're very proud of these initiatives. Next slide, please. So finally, as I mentioned, at EDC, our job is to help Canadian companies do business. And we do this in really three main ways. The first is help you, helping you to learn what you need to know by providing specialized and free market intelligence and insights so that you can make the most informed business decisions as you go global. Through our global presence with over 20 international offices and key markets around the world, EDC can offer trade insights as well as link Canadian companies to specific international opportunities. And finally, our goal is to help you feel secure and access the capital you need through various financial products and services that both help you manage risk and access the working capital that you need to fuel your success abroad. So I'll take some time now to sort of walk specifically through a couple of those solutions and resources that you can access. We'll go to the next slide, please. In fact, we'll advance two more slides. Yeah, just to, yeah, perfect. So one of the most key tools that you should be aware of and leverage when you're selling outside of Canada is credit insurance. This can protect your profits and, and your balance sheet by ensuring you against the risk of non-payment by your foreign customers. It reduces risk by covering your accounts receivable at up to 90%. It can allow you to be more competitive to offer better payment terms to your customers. And it can also help you increase access to working capital because financial institutions tend to assign more lending value to foreign receivables when they're insured. There's many flexible options for credit insurance that you can select the right coverage that's right for your needs. You can cover one contract, one or a few customers, or your entire portfolio of accounts receivable. Next slide, please. When it comes to access to capital for business growth, EDC has sub several valuable solutions which might be right for your company. The first one that I wanted to highlight is our Women in Trade investment program and this was launched in May 2019 with a 50 million dollar fund to help us close the gap in access to capital for women entrepreneurs and we subsequently increased this fund to 100 million early on in 2020. This fund comes in the form of equity capital through either direct investment in Canadian companies that are owned or strategically led at the C-suite level by one or more women. We also invest in this fund in Canadian venture capital funds that demonstrate a commitment to gender diversity, both in the portfolios that they invest in, but as well as in their investment decision making um, at their investment decision making table. Essentially, we want to support more female investors in the VC industry as well. So through this fund, EDC co-invests in women-led companies at the seed or Series A stage, typically with a minimum of uh, 1 million per year revenue run rate, and those who are commercialized with solid revenue traction and um, accelerating with significant export growth potential. Specifically, companies focused on sales and growth and managing cash flow, as well as stabilizing operations. Next slide, please. In addition to this equity fund, EDC has several tools where we partner with your financial institution so that you can access the working capital loans that you need to grow. Today, I'll focus on two main programs, but I encourage you to review our website so that you can see all the financial tools that could support your business. Firstly, our export guarantee program is widely used by the Canadian financial institutions to support companies who need to fund their growth. It's a risk sharing solution where EDC shares the risk with the bank on a loan facility that they provide to their business clients. It's extremely flexible and can be applied to any type of loan facility. Next slide, please. More specific to liquidity needs that companies faced at the onset of COVID, um, EDC launched um, as part of Canada's overall business credit availability program, a BCAP guarantee. It's very similar to the export guarantee program, but more streamlined to make it quicker to get cash into the hands of businesses who need it. 
Again, it relies on the financial institutions process. And so you as companies can access this loan guarantee program directly through your financial institution and you only deal with them. EDC provides comfort to the bank with an 80% guarantee on the loan for up to a five year term. In addition to this BCAP loan guarantee that was launched, EDC also launched a BCAP investment matching program for Canadian exporters looking to complete a raise during this pandemic period. EDC will match up to a maximum of $5 million in equity capital invested by private sector institutional venture capital or private equity firms um, and other corporate partners to help get the much needed capital out to businesses. Next slide, please. And I'm nearly done. Finally, I want to highlight just a few of the valuable non-financial resources that you can also access through EDC, all free of charge. Next slide, please. So there's a few keys to success when exporting and knowledge, preparation and planning are so important uh, as you embark on an export journey. And so EDC has curated some very specialized tools to help with this part, um, making it part of your, your trade toolkit. So I'll highlight just a couple of them. The Export Help Hub is a curated digital knowledge hub where companies can access insights and know-how on expanding internationally. Currently it's serving servicing the US and European Union markets and you can access expert insights through your peer that your peers are using to grow their US and European sales. It gives trustworthy answers to your market questions all in one place. The EDC InList draws on EDC's extensive global network to bring you a list of trusted service providers in Canada and in markets around the world to help connect you to the right contacts and put your export plans in motion. EDC Company Insight is an interactive digital tool that allows you to find reliable and trustworthy information on companies that you may be considering doing business with anywhere in the world. It can give guides Canadian exporters step-by-step step to help you conduct part of the due diligence that's needed before you partner with another global organization. It could be a first step that you take before reaching out, for example, to the Trade Commissioner Service. Um, EDC's Fit Light Learning Series will provide bite-sized learning modules that you can read about various exporting topics in less than an hour each. It's uh, specific topics such as market entry strategies, sales channel development, cash flow management, or international contracts or foreign exchange risk, risk is just to name a few of the subjects covered. And finally, EDC's Trade Insights website has such a ton of information. You can download EDC guides from our economics teams, as well as read eBooks on export topics um, on doing business in specific markets. The content in these guides can save you a lot of time when you're researching a market and can provide the ex expertise you need. So I'll leave it there, but happy to answer any other questions um, either at the end of the webinar if there's time or, or after, please do reach out. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Jennifer, for this uh, insightful presentation and, and never it stops to amaze me how much support that EDC is providing to our women entrepreneurs. So thank you so much for that. And I will, because um, we have uh, Rep Representative Chen back on, we'll skip the questions to the very end if we can. And um, so I'd like to now call upon the representative of Taiwan here in Canada from the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office, Representative Winston Chen to make remarks. Thank you. My name is Winston Wei Chen, the representative of Taipei Economic and Cultural Office in Canada. It is my great pleasure to join you today for the pre-mission training session of the first Canadian woman only virtual business mission to Taiwan, scheduled from March the 2nd to 3rd. 2021. On behalf of the government of Taiwan, I'd like to take this opportunity to sincerely welcome you and to say a few words. By fostering the great economic cooperation, strengthening people to people ties, and advancing the cause of gender equality in both Taiwan and Canada, your mission marks the first of what is hopefully to be many such engagements virtually and then physically in the future. Taiwan has long tried to serve as an example of the world about the importance 
of gender equality and the women's empowerment. It is our firm belief that women's rights are human rights. The gender equality is human rights is to the benefit of all people. And then that a society of an entire woman is bound to be more prosperous and then successful. To that end, Taiwan has distinguished itself as a country which takes women's empowerment seriously. According to the Council of Foreign Relations, Taiwan is marked as a top country in East Asia on women's work equality. By the same metrics used to develop the gender and again top the list of countries in Asia. There is no class feeling on what women can accomplish in Taiwan. Over 40% of our lawmakers are women and the highest percentage in all of Asia and among the top countries in the world. Madam President Tai Wan Ingwen is one of the female leaders in the world. Distinguish herself as one of Time Magazine's top 100 influential people and then leading Taiwan to be one of the world's most successful countries in battling COVID-19 while maintaining a robust economy and a relative normal daily life. The first Canadian woman only virtual business mission to Taiwan served as an opportunity for us to engage with and learn from a distinguished group of women who are leaders in business, government, academia, and the more. They will not only be an important opportunity to extend our people-to-people -people linkage and strengthen our economic cooperation, but will also serve to highlight some of the many women in our society who stand at the top of their respective fields. In addition to discussion on trade, investment, technological partnership, and other economic matters. This virtual mission will future robust policy discussion focus on women's social and economic empowerment and entrepreneurship. Taiwan and Canada have much to gain from this dialogue. We not only share the goal of advancing gender equality but we also have much to build upon in our already robust trading relationship. Taiwan is Canada's 13th largest trading partner and Canada's fifth largest partner in Asia. This robust relationship is facilitated by Taiwan's fair, free, and welcoming market for Canadian investment. In particular, we have a vibrant technological sector with major contribution to international supply chain, not only in electronics and the semiconductors manufacturing, but also in biomedical sciences, agri-food, and in clean technology that will protect our environment. I'm sure many of you will hear more about business opportunity in this industry during this mission. Let me conclude by saying thank you for your participation and I wish you a very fruitful discussion and have a pleasant time. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Representative Chen, for your warm uh, words and also the uh, insightful information provided to the audience today. So uh, with no further ado, we're going to ask Michelle Scarborough to take the mic. Michelle. Perfect. Thank you, Christine. It's a pleasure to be here and congratulations to all of you who are um, embarking on this virtual mission to Taiwan. I've done lots of business in Taiwan in my own career and I can tell you you're in for a treat. They are a very wel welcoming and warm environment and uh, and I think you'll you'll very much enjoy a vibrant uh, a vibrant relationship and a synergistic one. 
I'm here today representing BDC, the Business Development Bank of Canada. Um, we lovingly refer to, to the bank as BDC, which really truly is the bank for entrepreneurs. It is the only Canadian bank devoted to entrepreneurs exclusively. And we compliment many of our colleagues on the call today, both the EDC, the Trade Commission Service, whom we work with very closely in order to facilitate what we do, which is provide financing, advisory services, and capital to entrepreneurs across Canada. I'm gonna move through the, um, the first set of slides quickly so we can get to the punchline of, of how we support women entrepreneurs specifically. But if we can just stop at maybe slide, uh, that's that's perfect, yes, <laughs> thank you very much, Nadine. Um, just by the, uh, I won't go into any of the by the numbers because that's really truly been covered, but. But really, in a nutshell, um, we provide three levels of service to entrepreneurs across Canada. And those entrepreneurs have businesses that range from very small uh, bricks and mortar all the way to very high growth technical technology enterprises. So you can think of them as the, as the gamut, which is part of the reason why we're so collaborative with many partners across the ecosystem, both inside of the country and also outside of the country, as we think about these companies being able to accelerate and, uh, and and basically build an, uh, an entity and an organization that, that will benefit the, econ the, the Canadian economy. Um, we also pr perform a variety of additional sort of specialized financing services, including mezzanine financing, leasing, and so on, and have been, a, as you've probably seen in the news, a very big uh, proponent of uh, many of the COVID programs that have supported companies that have been hit hardest by the, uh, the COVID pandemic, both um, over the course of 2020 and also you may have seen the January 27th announcement of the new program that BDC is running which is the highly affected sectors credit availability program uh, which is a guarantee program again to support entrepreneurs across the country who have been adversely and continue to be adversely affected by COVID-19. We also provide a number of advisory services. I'm not gonna get into a number of them here, but we have a very robust advisory services team at BDC and those folks come from industry. They have our entrepreneurs or come from areas in business where they can support you as an entrepreneur trying to grow your business. And they are sort of call it the, uh, the arms that can wrap around you as you're trying to figure out some of the ways in which you need or some of the tools that you need in order to accelerate into into your market, whatever that market might be, and we leverage them um, in across all parts of the bank, and certainly in BDC Capital, which is what I'm going to um, kind of talk about next. I'll move to slide five if you can, Nadine. Thanks. Um, slide five just gives you a little bit of our reach, so this just shows you how how broad our reach is as BDC as uh, as the bank. Um, we serve 62,000 entrepreneurs across Canada, um, 2,400 employees really from coast to coast and a real stretch. And we have about 36.5 billion in capital committed to entrepreneurs across the country. So this is just representative of, of where we're going and you know, obviously a lot more to do. I'll move to the next slide, please. So this is where I live. This is where I get excited. I, I work in uh, BDC Capital and my role is in the venture capital arm of BDC Capital. We'll talk about the Women in Technology Venture Fund in a second, but I did want to just give you a bit of a broad stroke in terms of what BDC Capital actually accomplishes. We have about two billion under management in BDC Capital and we provide financing and this is a combination of equity and debt uh, across a number of platforms venture capital, IP financing, so intellectual property financing, a large clean tech practice, and growth equity. So you can think of growth equity as a little bit on the edge of private equity. But we provide that capital across this platform really from seed all the way to scale and work with entrepreneurs. Many of these entrepreneurs in our BDC Capital practice are technology entrepreneurs that have technology embedded in their, in their companies and are looking to really scale on a global basis. And all of the activities and all of the funds that lay within BDC Capital form the basis for collaboration of the entrepreneur and the company as they grow and accelerate over the course of their life cycle, as well as over the course of their financing life cycle. 
which as you know, as you're growing and looking to scale, differs at various different inflection points um, as, you're, as you're continuing to, to accelerate and move into new international markets. I'll just move to the next slide, please. So in venture capital, um, again, we've talked about the fact that there's $2 billion under management, but really we're talking specifically about equity investments directly, indirectly through uh, a huge fund of funds program that we also run, led by Allison Nankaville, uh, who some of you may already have heard of because of Allison's very broad, um, uh, broad scope. Um, and also through our sort of ecosystem development where we can bring people together and link them in the ecosystem to support the growth of, of the venture capital ecosystem broadly. In the direct investment group, what I, what I want to articulate here for you so that you kind of get it is that not only do we have a seed fund and the Women in Technology Fund, which I'm going to talk about in a second, but we also have funds that are very focused, sec focused sectorally. So if you think about doing business in um, externally in Taiwan, if you're in ag tech as an example, we have a fund now that has been stood up. It's a $250 million fund. It's called the Industrial Innovation Fund, and its job is to provide equity into fast growing venture capital oriented companies that are export oriented. So that's one example. We have another fund that um, is the ICE fund, which is more clean tech oriented, and then IT and healthcare, much smaller and um, um, and now have spun out of the organization in what is now called Amplitude Ventures and Framework Ventures. So very broad and very broadly connected to, our, to the underlying funds across the Canadian ecosystem. Um, we are a fund of funds investor, a limited partner investor in most of the venture capital funds in Canada of any size. And we're a big, um, really a big leader in making sure that the venture capital ecosystem remain vibrant and healthy as we've sort of moved through this next piece. And you, we are seeing a lot of venture capital in the Canadian market now for companies looking for financing and equity financing in particular. So I'll move on to the next slide and we can spend a bit a bit more time. Um, maybe slide nine, Nadine. Does that work? That's perfect. So BBC a number of years ago decided that it would take a bold step in concert with the government of Canada to really step out and take a leadership role in supporting women entrepreneurs. And so we created our own women entrepreneur strategy, um, which had a number of pillars, which included building relationships, building support through events, connecting the ecosystem for women entrepreneurs everywhere, and then providing financial solutions to support those women where they were and where they were intending on going. And so we struck a number of initiatives um, that included the Women in Technology Fund that would su support that overall growth and, and mission to make sure that women entrepreneurs had all of the tools in the toolkit that allowed them to grow. So if we move to the next slide, I'm just going to talk about a few of those. So the first was uh, obviously capital. Many women are were looking for term loans. We have, we made a, a I'm going to say a bold move to put to try to put 1.4 billion dollars to work by 2021 as a lending target. We have doubled that, so we are now significantly um, involved in many of the entrepreneur women-led entrepreneurial companies in Canada that are looking for term loans, that are looking for financial support of that nature. We opened up and offered a supplier diversity program, very similar to what EDC offers and very complementary to EDC's offering. And so we will often refer, refer women who are looking to um, do exporting or looking for suppliers to both EDC's website and to BDC. So you can get the full gamut of what, uh, what is available to you and make selections based on the, the current needs of your organization. We support hundreds of events every single year to bring women together to support missions like this one and many others um, across Canada and on an ongoing basis. And we champion um, obviously the Women in Technology Venture Fund, which um, I think we're going to go to right now if I can get the slide to change, <laughs> which is perfect. Thank you. The, um, the Women in Technology Venture Fund was a unique initiative by BDC and BDC Capital in particular, and it was 
Um, it did arise as a result of a need in the market by women entrepreneurs in technology who wanted to found or be part of a leadership team to grow their businesses. So we launched the, the $200 million Women in Tech Fund four years ago with a pretty bold mandate to do three things, to directly invest in women-led technology businesses that were high growth, venture oriented, so they had a technology that they wanted to export and take globally. We do indirect investing out of that portfolio, we have a small allocation for that, and we spend an inordinate amount of time as a part of our efforts building the ecosystem of both investor, women investors and women who want to lead in technology companies. So very, very big mandate. Um, like I said, four years, four years in the making, and with a very specific technology focus. So think about us as any type, any other type of venture capital fund with an intention to drive a return, but as importantly, to make sure that we have a vibrant ecosystem of women in tech and women in finance on the capital side, such that we're not having a discussion around where are the women leaders across the, across the boardroom table, we're actually seeing them at the boardroom table. And if we just go to slide, the next slide after that, please. So our investing approach is very straightforward. We invest in companies from seed to scale. We have a long-term view of our investment and we want to partner with our technology companies and our entrepreneurs. So we are looking at a long relationship, not a short relationship, with an intention that we are uh, patient capital, but helping you to drive the growth of your business as you grow internationally. So our whole job is to make sure that we have Canadian champions and women who can be the best role models for others as they look to develop their own careers. And then to, dis to establish a broad and enabling network in order to support women along their journey. So again, so that we can see many, many others just like us in the marketplace um, supporting the growth of, of companies as they uh, move along their life cycle. We also are doing a lot of, uh, bringing a lot of effort together um, with others in the marketplace, partners in the marketplace to get women off of the sidelines in order to add their capital to the ecosystem so that women can become active investors, putting their money to work on the equity and debt side in, sort, in order to support more women entrepreneurs. So if we just move to the next slide, please. This just gives you an example of us by the numbers. We have 32 portfolio companies right now. Those portfolio companies are very broad across many sectors. Um, so we have clean tech companies in our portfolio, e-commerce companies in our portfolio, um, B2B software portfolio companies in our portfolio, and clean tech companies in our portfolio. We have a little light on, on life sciences, but we are looking to correct that with a few, uh, a few um, new investments. But 32 portfolio companies right now, all of them um, reaching global markets, all of them doing business in global markets. Five emerging funds, some of which we are co-invested in with EDC, and then about 200, about 2000 plus interactions with women across the network with through all of our, our activities. Um, but I think the biggest thing to note here is really the breadth of what we're trying to do and the amount of, of collaboration that it takes in order to make these kinds of initiatives happen. And that's really what the, the again, the focus of the, the impact of our fund is. So what that amounts to is about 50 million deployed capital, and we'll probably see the remaining capital deployed in the next year. And then if we move to the to the uh, next slide, you know, as I mentioned, none of this is possible without the help of the ecosystem and without some very strong partnerships like the Asia Pacific Foundation, like EDC, like the Trade Commission Service, and many others across the landscape. We companies, we always say that it takes a village to grow a company and it takes a village to grow a women-led company. And Without the network and the support of many of the, um, I know you've got Logo Soup there that you're looking at, but but many of these, most of these folks are very, very heavily involved in all of the work that we do. They're 
folks that bring us deal flow, but they're also as importantly individuals and organizations that contribute to the contribute to the success of our portfolio and the broader ecosystem over time. And they all play a role working together to make that happen, which is very unique in Canada. It's very unique in Canada. I can tell you that from, from many of our interactions with our partners south of the border. Um, and so something to make sure that you're thinking about is you're not just exporting and looking at some of these missions, but also how can you leverage the resources you have in your local communities in order to make sure that you get the support that you require and that you need. And then finally, just on the last slide, there's a number of, you know, you, you've all probably seen the many, many, many resources that are out there and available to you, but I do encourage you, like Jennifer had said um, before, and like Sarah has said, do leverage the resources that are available. There are many of them, they're very good. Um, people are always prepared to take your call and to ask questions, you know, answer your questions and so on, but do take advantage of that. It's very unique for diversity and women and, and uh, inclusion right now. We have a, a very golden opportunity to take advantage of the, the momentum that has been built over the last number of years and to really accelerate that. And this is a perfect storm and a perfect opportunity to work with the, the people on this call and many, many others um, to really, you know, grab the grab the golden ring, so to speak, and and take it to the next level for your business, for your employees, and and for your families. So I'll leave you with that. Um, by all means, please feel free to go to bdc.ca if you have any further questions, and I'm happy to take any questions at the end of the webinar, uh, time permitting, or otherwise you can reach out to me on LinkedIn, and I'm I'm happy to jump on a call with you. Thank you so much, Michelle, for that uh, very informative session. And before we go on to um, the provincial uh, speakers, uh, representatives of the provinces, I thought we'd take a few questions right here because we are on uh, on schedule, believe it or not, <laughs> despite the technical difficulties. So um, one question uh, that came up is, um, and, and uh, you mentioned, uh, Michelle, about uh, your experience with the Taiwan market. But this question is um, valid for either yourself or for Jennifer, could or even Sarah. Um, could you speak of and do you know of any uh, Canadian SME cases that um, have done well that you supported in in Taiwan that you could speak to? You don't have to name the company or anything, but uh, is any um, case uh, cases where we've um, a Canadian company has done well in Taiwan? So I can't. I I have a few cases that I won't mention the name of it. If people mm -hmm. want to ping me afterwards, I can probably hook you up so you can actually have a direct conversation. Um, most of those were in life sciences, believe it or not, or in um, uh, photonics. Mm -hmm. So some six, six very specific companies there, um, but the relationships that they were able to build, both from a supply chain perspective and also from a just um, co-creation of new technologies perspective was very, very well received. And those companies are still in business today. They still continue to operate and do well. Um, and they used, in, in one case in particular, they used Taiwan as a bit of a, um, a landing pad to do business and then expand to the rest of Asia. So they kind of went that route. Um, but I'm happy to kind of offline, if, if somebody wants to reach out to me, I'm happy to See if there's an introduction to be made there. You can at least get some firsthand, um, firsthand advice. Fantastic. Thank you very much, um, Jennifer. I'm going to ask you. Do you know of um, from the EDC perspective of any particular um, SMEs and particularly women, if if you know of any um, that uh, EDC supported and has. Uh, thanks, Christine. I hope you guys can hear me. You cut off a little bit for me there when you were switching over to me, but um, I'm sure there's plenty, Christine. Um, there's one that comes to my mind actually most recently. Now, this isn't necessarily um, uh, a woman entrepreneur that's selling into Taiwan, but that's leveraging Taiwan from a supply chain perspective. And so it's nice to highlight because EDC can also help um, companies that um, you know, from the supply chain perspective, whether it's, you know, you need to fund um, down payments 
it's from your suppliers and things like that to, to sell around the world. This is an area that EDC can help that maybe a lot of people aren't necessarily aware of. So we're looking at helping one entrepreneur get the funding she need because during COVID, supply chains, as we know, have gotten really tight. And now some of these suppliers are looking for larger minimum orders and larger down payments before that you can even get in the manufacturing queue. And those are all things that we can potentially work together with a financial institution to make sure that Canadian companies have access to the working capital they need um, to manage you know, their supply chain. That's just one example that I can think of off the top of my head, Christine, but uh, um, there's other opportunities for sure. That's great. And, you know, um, I think that uh, many of the uh, people listening in today will know, but Taiwan has never really locked down their economy because they've managed the COVID situation so well and uh, partly because of the uh, technology that they were able to implement very quickly to for contact tracing or what have you. And uh, so I, th I believe that to this date, um, they have less than a thousand infections from the, for the last year and uh, under uh, double digit deaths in Taiwan. So in fact, uh, I think that uh, definitely the supply chains, uh, the economy has been, you know, chugging along in Taiwan, unlike uh, the rest of Asia or even in Canada. So anyway, that's great. So then and now I'm going to call upon the our provincial representatives and we're going to start with Corey McDougall. Corey represents the Ontario Ministry and over to you, Corey. Okay, thanks, Christine. And I think Nadine is racing away in the background, changing, <laughs> changing yes. presentations. Thank you. Um, great. So, as Christine mentioned, I'm with the Ontario Ministry of Economic Development, Job Creation, and Trade. And I'm going to just spend a bit of time discussing the different program supports and uh, options that the Ontario government offers to companies, primarily SMEs, that are looking to export. And as with the previous speakers, we work um, very closely with um, our partners, Global Affairs Canada and the Trade Commissioner's Service, BDC, EDC. Um, so it's great that we're all, we're all here at the same time. So moving on to the next slide. This provides an overview of the services that we offer. And a lot of the, uh, the services and supports that I'm gonna be talking about are pretty hands-on, uh, on the ground type programs. Um, the following slides go into a bit more detail on each of the uh, rows here in blue, so I'm not going to go deep here. I'll just draw your attention to the fact that um, along the top there, we've got programs to work with companies from the very beginning, um, early stage exporters, companies who may not have yet exported at all, but are considering it, recognize that there's some opportunity there and want to um, to explore all the way through programs for um, early exporters, companies just uh, getting started and then through to experienced exporters. Moving on to the next slide. This this is just here to acknowledge the fact that obviously uh, the last year has been very different uh, in our space and we've the transition has actually been really interesting at the very beginning there was a concern how how do you do international business development when you can't get on a plane you're not meeting face to face nothing can replace face to face a lot of concern um, and we've seen and it's been interesting having that perspective where we generally lead about 70, 75 trade missions around the world in a year um, to all different markets. So seeing the different um, reactions of different um, countries in terms of how they've handled it, how um, international events have gone virtual, what platforms are being used, how it works. And also in speaking with the Ontario companies, seeing that the evolution from, as I was mentioning, the concern, uh, you know, nothing will replace face to face, uh, but we'll give it a try because, you know, there's no alternative. So we'll try doing these virtual alternatives and then really seeing, and I think this is good news for everyone who's all lined up for their virtual trade mission um, at the beginning of March, but really seeing some good success. Um, we're, 
I'm hearing from companies, um, some are saying, you know what, don't don't take me back to face to face or at least give me a hybrid, but not having to get on a plane, not having the jet lag, not having the expense, not having the time away from the office is offering an advantage and allowing a lot of companies to explore uh, and go a bit further than they might have otherwise been able to. So not all uh, bad news in this space at all. Um, moving on to the next slide. The uh, and now I'm just going to go through. I've got some slides that go a bit deeper into each of the areas of programming that's offered across the ministry. So we have some programs and these would be many of these are oriented to the early stage exporters that I mentioned at the beginning. So we have exporting 101 courses. So just really basic what you need to think about when you're getting started. We offer a NEBS program, which is usually quite popular. It's uh, new exporters to border states. And basically that's a very hands on program used to actually before things went virtual put you on a bus and drive across the border to Buffalo to understand uh, how how it works. If you are shipping goods um, from Canada to the US, what do you you know what do you go through? And the program includes much more to that than that. Um, also addressing some of the questions that come up uh, to do with exporting services, etc. But um, that's a popular one. We've got webinars that Another thing I should have mentioned um, as a result of the pandemic, we've altered or I guess enhanced our programming to address some of the challenges that companies are facing right now. So looking at navigating through turbulent times, uh, what are some of the issues you're dealing with in terms of talent and labor, uh, tech adoption, there are a lot of programs available right now to help uh, companies, particularly smaller companies, get up to speed to be able to um, take advantage of things like e-commerce as a means of reaching new markets, that sort of thing. Uh, moving on to the next slide, please. This is uh, this is the work that my team does, and we're so we're very um, much on the program side. We've got um, we offer one on one advisory services. I've got a team of 25 uh, market consultants who have all lived and worked in the markets that they cover. So these are people who speak the language, know the culture, have some networks in these markets and are available to speak with you to help you understand what you need to be aware of as you're moving into these markets. We offer webinars uh, looking at specific markets, looking at specific sectors. We look at um, e-commerce opportunities in different markets. Who are the major players in different markets that you would want to work with? It's not all Amazon. Uh, depending where you're going. Pitch preparation webinars, I know that's come up. Definitely a great um, type of program to get you in front of uh, key players and different markets. We've introduced a new version of this recently, which has, has put some focus on the virtual pitch. So it, it's always important to work on your pitch, but now that pitches are being done online, what do you need to be aware of? What's different? How is the follow-up different? What tools do you use? That sort of thing. Uh, trade missions, these have changed. They are all virtual now and and we'll see how you know things start to transition back to some sort of hybrid or in person trade mission. And these um, vary from country to country. It depends. Often our trade missions would be anchored around an international trade show. So we would bring a delegation of Ontario companies. We work together with other provinces, with uh, Global Affairs Canada to um, if they're also participating to bring together companies under the Canadian umbrella and then under the uh, provincial showcases. These um, still go ahead even in the virtual environment. There's been some really interesting opportunities that have come up in terms of digital promotion and online promotion um, and using social channels to um, to drive track it, traffic and um, increase interest in companies that are participating in those shows. So that's been interesting. Uh, B2B meetings are a very big part of trade missions, whether they're virtual or um, in person. And Christine, you mentioned that that, of course, would be part of the upcoming trade mission to Taiwan. Uh, these are great um, meetings that are organized in advance for the participating companies with companies that meet their interests in terms of their objectives, profiles. Um, so a really great thing to take advantage of. And uh, 
site visits. These, of course, look different in the virtual world, but it's the same idea, right? Like, get out. What what does a manufacturing business in Taiwan look like? What does um, you know a services business in uh, Singapore look like? So, um, really interesting opportunities there. Um, meet the buyer program. That's similar to the site visit that I mentioned and includes elements of the pitch preparation, but where we pull together buyers from a particular sector and a particular market and get our Ontario delegation in front of those buyers. We um, also, as I mentioned, we work with our partners. We're all we're not in this alone. There's it doesn't make any sense. Uh, we're, most of the people on this call have the same mandate in terms of supporting companies, Canadian companies, Ontario companies. So uh, facilitate those introductions in market and uh, here locally as well. And next slide. We also have a few other things within the ministry that support Ontario companies. So inbound business missions, this is where we attract delegations from other countries to us. A big part of it is investment attraction, um, but it's also um, promoting and communicating internationally the advantages that that we have here to offer. So we'll provide ecosystem tours to a say an AI delegation coming in from France. We'll uh, take them on an ecosystem tour of what we have here in Ontario will introduce Ontario companies to the incoming delegation. So there's some there's there could be some direct opportunity for com for Ontario companies if uh, you're set up with meetings with the uh, incoming delegates. There's also just the um, the advantage that comes from having the depth of expertise of the ecosystem that you're a part of being promoted internationally. So it, when you, when you go into a new market and you're trying to um, pitch your, your company, your services, what you have to offer. If there's already an understanding and an appreciation of uh, where you come from, it's helpful. So we, uh, we're we working on these. Um, B2, business to government is also a part of this because of course that whole diplomatic connection is important as well. And uh, and we promote, we're, and this is one of the things that's come up during um, the move to the online environment is when we're, attending an international trade show. Uh, for instance, we had the Singapore FinTech Festival at the end of last year. We had a large delegation there and we ran through our inbound business missions group. Um, they ran a webinar featuring Toronto's FinTech um, ecosystem and talking about what we've got going on here. So it, as I mentioned, supported the Ontario delegation that was attending this show. So just work complementing uh, the work that's being done on the trade side as well. And then finally, the next slide. It, this shows Ontario's international presence. So we've got 16 offices, uh, trade and investment offices around the world. They're co-located in the Canadian embassies or high commissions and consulates and work very closely with Global Affairs and our other partners, but provide that extra support for Ontario companies in market. And this is something that I see um, as we are moving forward, um, perhaps into sort of a hybrid model of uh, international events and international business development. I know in Japan recently, there was a trade show that took place in person, but primarily it was just for the domestic market because, of course, there's not a lot of international travel. So having those in market resources to um, support our companies um, at these events is, of course, very helpful. So I think it'll be interesting to see how this plays out as well. And then sorry, that wasn't the final slide. The next slide is the final slide. And this is just a couple of links for you to check out um, Ontario.ca slash trade calendar that lists the different um, events that we have coming up right now. I think we've got up until June on the website, but we're just over the course of this week actually getting the next year's events posted. So check back and see what you're interested in. You can search by market as well as by sector. And then the source from Ontario.com site is um, it's an area where you can see what some of the delegations that we've brought to international events were we're taking that virtual booth that we invested in and put up at international shows and hosting it on the website 
uh, the source from Ontario.com. So it's an opportunity to continue to promote um, yourselves uh, as a company that participates in these shows um, on the website because we will be driving traffic there and it's a place that uh, we can encourage international uh, companies to check out to see what's there. So please take a look and um, as we've all said, happy to answer any questions and very happy to uh, direct you to the right person on my team and to talk to you um, individually about your interest in exporting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Corey. Uh, questions are pouring in here, but um, I think uh, in the interest of time, we'll first uh, do BC and, and then uh, take some questions or ask some questions. So uh, over to you, uh, Benjamin. Thank you very much, Christine. I hope everyone can hear me all right. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Ben Kaliznik, and uh, I'm a senior manager with British Columbia's uh, Trade Policy and Negotiations Branch in the Ministry of Jobs, Economic Recovery and Innovation. Um, I'm calling in from the territories of the Lekwungen speaking peoples and the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nations today. Uh, it's great to be presenting on BC's export promotion mission and goals and uh, trade support services that the province of BC offers. Uh, for those mission participants who uh, are from BC, I hope you can uh, take away at least one new thing about the province's trade agenda and trade supports today. Um, and then for those of you who are not from BC, I hope that um, maybe this presentation convinces you to move here. Uh, next slide, please. The ministry's mandate is to build a strong, sustainable economy and improve the standard of living for all British Columbians. Uh, it is to assist businesses with leveraging trade opportunities in uh, existing and new markets, uh, encourage trade diversification, fight trade protectionism, and enhance market access for BC's exports. Uh, support communities in all regions of the province to attract investment to create resiliency uh, and assist underrepresented export groups, uh, including women and SMEs more generally throughout British Columbia. And on this last point, I would note that uh, BC has been very supportive of Canada's inclusive approach to trade, uh, which aims to ensure that the benefits and opportunities that flow from trade uh, are really more widely shared. Increasing trade and investment for British Columbia is critical to building a strong and sustainable economy and really is an important part of our government's economic recovery plan. Uh, next slide. Now, BC's export promotion mission and goals uh, are really delivered through uh, various activities throughout uh, our provincial government and, of course, um, in working with its partners, uh, various organizations. Um, but within our ministry specifically, um, we really are working to link BC businesses with buyers, investors, and other key partners in global markets. Uh, facilitating BC companies' participation at uh, major trade events. Uh, supporting outbound and inbound trade missions, uh, connecting exporters uh, to appropriate resources in BC as well as internationally, um, participating in trade readiness programs to assist with uh, company readiness for uh, global markets, and um, representing, this is sort of where my role is, is uh, representing BC interests in trade disputes, and free trade agreement negotiations uh, and promoting the benefits of free trade agreements to BC businesses like yours. Uh, now, as you probably know, Canada does not have a free trade agreement with Taiwan, um, but given that it is part of my role, I really wanted to just put in a plug for those efforts. And um, this slide just shows, uh, shows you some of the things that we've been doing, some of the videos and presentations that we've been doing um, lately. Next slide, please. BC and uh, its entrepreneurs uh, like yourselves uh, really need to be able to adapt to uh, an international trade landscape that is continually changing. 
Uh, and it can sometimes be very tough to, uh, to know what's going on in a market halfway across the world, let alone being able to connect with someone that you can trust to do business with there. Um, that's why we have BC's trade and investment uh, representative network uh, uh, throughout the world. Um, this is a map sim very similar to the map that you just saw from, from Corey uh, representing Ontario's representatives. And um, their role really is to uh, help international businesses discover the, uh, the benefits of British Columbia as a destination for investment, um, a partner for trade and innovation, and really a source of quality goods, services, and resources. Um, but they also provide you with local market knowledge uh, and intelligence. Uh, they can help you identify key contacts in market, as well as assist with uh, targeted trade shows and really just getting you set up for visits to market. Now, as you can see from the map, when it comes to places like Taiwan, where BC does not have a trade and investment representative, uh, we first encourage you to uh, work with the Trade Commissioner Service, which you've learned uh, a lot about already today. Um, that said, you can always contact people like myself or, or anyone else in our division uh, if you come across any trade related issues uh, or just have questions about uh, Taiwan or, or really any market for that matter. Uh, if we don't have the answer, we will connect you with the people that, uh, that do. Uh, next slide, please. Another trade support uh, program I want to highlight from BC is our Export Navigator program. Uh, unlike the Trade and Investment uh, Representative Network, uh, BC's Export uh, Navigator advisors are located closer to home. Now, the important thing you need to know is that these advisors are geared specifically to working with uh, businesses in BC's regions as opposed to the lower mainland or capital region areas. Um, and so this map here shows you the regions that are serviced by those advisors. Um, now, even though those, those uh, advisors are focused on the regions, the good news is that the program also has de dedicated advisors um, specifically working with women Indigenous and youth-owned businesses. Next slide, please. The advisors can provide you with a free, personalized, step-by-step -step, uh, approach to exporting and um, really connect you to market information uh, or um, uh, export programs, financial services, um, and really just the business development experts um, that can get you started or, or keep you going if you're already exporting. Uh, they offer things like uh, in-person guidance from the advisor, um, export readiness assessments, um, and really just that step-by-step -step approach, um, and really try to connect you with the right people at the right time uh, during the year. And so whether your business already is exporting a volume or you run a smaller enterprise that um, hasn't yet crossed borders, the Export Navigator program is here to really demystify that export process and help your business grow. Next slide, please. Um, there isn't any provincial, BC provincial government funding that is specific for women entrepreneurs. Uh, however, Small Business BC is a nonprofit that operates at arm's length from the provincial government. Uh, they receive core funding from both the provincial and federal governments. And Small Business BC does have some supports for both just entrepreneurs generally, but also for female entrepreneurs looking to, uh, to start or grow their business. Um, things like the things you see on the slide here, free business plan templates and cash forecasting tools, um, seminars and advisory. And uh, in fact, um, uh, Small Business BC has some, some women entrepreneurship topic, uh, focus topics, um, including one on women, how women are driving uh, business change, and that is coming up um, later this month. Please visit that link if you have any interest in that. Uh, the Women's Enterprise Center of British Columbia um, is also a nonprofit organization devoted to helping BC women start and lead and grow their own business. And they provide things like business skills training, um, personalized business advice and mentorship, and um, uh, just sort of practical resources, as well as a supportive community for women business owners. 
Uh, the last thing on this slide here I'll highlight is BC's uh, COVID-19 supports for businesses. This has been mentioned a few times. This link here will bring you to um, uh, sort of a, a library of all of the supports that are available, not just the um, provincial BC specific ones, uh, but really BC is also really trying to support people and businesses in the recovery from the pandemic and um, delivering initiatives that will, that will directly uh, support small businesses and build that inclusive economic recovery across British Columbia. Um, please visit this link. I, there's unfortunately just not enough time to cover all of these, but there are some that are women specific, including the, uh, those that are delivered through the Women's Enterprise Center. Uh, and last slide, please. I've uh, thrown a lot of information in a very short period of time at you, and so I apologize for that. But I hope um, I hope if there's just one thing that you take away, it's that uh, BC has a, a division that is specifically here to to support you in your journey, whether that's related to Taiwan or or other markets. Um, it's really across the trade spectrum. Uh, we we really are here to provide a service for BC businesses, any BC businesses that are looking to take their, their product, uh, their service or their technology beyond BC's borders, whether those are international or domestic. Um, just uh, if you don't know where to start, please just connect with me and I will make sure that uh, you are connected to the right person. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben, for that uh, presentation. And I should mention here right now that um, we only had time for our two provincial representatives today, but uh, earlier today when we sent the um, agenda to all the delegates, we did list all the links to the other provincial supports, uh, provincial government supports. So um, for those of you, we have a delegation that rep is representing uh, coast to coast of Canada. And so um, those on the East Coast, the prairies that were not uh, we didn't have a presentation for you today. Please visit those links or come back to us and we're happy to uh, connect you to the representatives in those provinces. So um, thank you very much, Benjamin and Corey. And um, wow, so much support, so much information to, uh, to um, uh, absorb. But what we've done is um, we're going to share the slides that everybody provided, if that's OK with the speakers. Um, as well as the recording with our delegates and so they can get the contact info and I know Corey they wanted um, contact information from your staff that uh, handles Taiwan um, and uh, we had uh, Ben's but um, if you can share that with us that would be great and and certainly um, the offer of uh, services to uh, help um, companies prepare a pitch for virtual missions that's an excellent tool and in fact, I'm going to all the Ontarians listening today uh, that are on the delegation, they will be contacting you, I'm sure, because they have to prepare a 10 minute uh, video on their pitch for the uh, mission. So you may get inundated. So sorry about that. <laughs> no, that's um, great. <laughs> <laughs> and um, there's a couple of questions here in the last few minutes, if I can um, ask. Um, uh, there was a question on between uh, for EDC. Um, at the pilot stage for a company, is there seed funding that you could provide to help them? They're planning to launch in the third Q, uh, Q3 this year, their product. Jennifer, can you talk to that? Uh, sure, Christine. I mean, yeah, it's totally dependent on, uh, you know, the company specifics. Typically, when EDC is getting involved, the company is commercialized. There's some level of of um, revenue, like for example, in our equity fund, we're looking for at least a million dollars in revenue. But between the BDC fund that Michelle leads um, and EDC, like happy to have a specific conversation if somebody's looking to to. Um, so please share the deck. It has my contact information, and uh, happy to connect with somebody that wants to look at that more closely. Also from um, from BDC and EDC, there was a question in terms of um, the application process, roughly from the time that a company applies, uh, what is the timeline roughly to get a decision? If they're eligible and everything else, they meet the uh, eligibility criteria. Can you give us an idea? So again, I'll take a stab and then let Michelle, um, again, it really does depend. But for example, with our loan guarantee programs, 
Um, you know, it starts with a conversation with the financial institution. Um, in our case, we're working together with the financial institution. So it really depends on whether the documentation is ready. It's together. The quicker the package comes together and the bank can adjudicate their, their loan, um, we take a, a couple of weeks once the bank's process is finalized. So we can uh, expedite timelines uh, when possible and when everything's well aligned, but um, you know, there's no one size fits all answer to that question, unfortunately. Sorry. Okay. Uh, and BC, you want to add? BC, BC, is BC is the same, Christine. Yeah, it's uh, we follow a similar path that that EDC does, and it can go faster or slower depending on the stage, as well as you know how much information you have available. Are you ready to go on the for the for debt? If it's equity, that's a whole different ball game for us. Mm -hmm. and equity because we're basically investing in you and and for that we're also becoming a shareholder of your company we tend to take longer in order to get to a decision because we'll go right into the weeds on your company with you looking at everything from your intellectual property right through to yes. you know what does the technology look like how do you build a moat around it what's your value proposition and so on so that takes you know, upwards of two to three months, depending on whether we have an existing relationship with you or not, and depending on where you come from vis-a-vis -a, -vis a referral. So if you were to come from Jennifer, and we have a very good working relationship with Jennifer, we're likely to take that referral to heart a little bit more because if we know that Jennifer has already vetted you. So mm -hmm. we don't have to kind of do as much digging as we would otherwise. So those are some of the things that you'd want to consider if you're thinking about equity, versus debt and when. OK, thank you very much for that. So um, in closing, I'd like to thank the speakers today and uh, of course our uh, supporting organizations that helped us uh, put this together. But in any event, um, I'd like to also thank, uh, uh, I know that uh, Sarah, we didn't ask you any questions today, but uh, we have another training session this, this evening. So for the delegates only, uh, just a reminder, at 8 o'clock tonight, we have a special training on the Trade Commissioner Service with the uh, Canadian Trade Office in Taipei. And so don't forget to log in at 8 p.m. tonight. We have uh, sector-specific training and briefing for you from all the Trade Commissioners. So I want to thank uh, Sarah for that because uh, these are her Trade Commissioners and we're really delighted that to get the support of our Taipei office. So with no further ado, thank you everybody for taking the time to join us today. And we look forward to seeing you again on the 19th of February. We will have the next uh, public training session. So good night, uh, good afternoon, and thank you very much, everybody. Bye-bye.